Despite hailing from dissimilar genres and eras, Jerry Schatzberg's The Panic in Needle Park, a gritty, dramatic 1971 exploration of New York City's heroin culture, and William Friedkin's 2006 black horror comedy Bug, both explore the corrosivity of codependent relationships through similar cinematic grammar. The relationships in each film start with an instant attraction that quickly deteriorates into mutual destruction. In Panic, a 31-year-old Al Pacino plays drug dealer and heroin user Bobby, who meets and pursues the Midwestern ingenue Helen. Now, what was it like where you come from? I mean, when you was a kid growing up. It was all right. In a role that won her Best Actress at the 1971 Cannes Film Festival, Kitty Wynn portrays Helen descending into addiction and dysfunction as she falls in love with Bobby. Their relationship is consecrated in a powerful scene of intimacy, despite the fact that it takes place in a room full of addicts. As Schatzberg's camera focuses on an arm being shot full of heroin, Helen asks Bobby, if I went away somewhere, would you come with me? After some equivocation, Bobby replies in the affirmative. The stage is set for the relationship's fortunes to be permanently linked with their addictions. If I went away somewhere, would you come with me? Where? Yeah. Drugs are consumed with great frequency in the adaptation of Pulitzer Prize winner Tracy Letts' play Bug, but the toxicity of the relationship at its core stems from paranoid delusion. Agnes, played by Ashley Judd, is a waitress at a small town Oklahoma lesbian bar. In a role he originated on stage, Michael Shannon is shy drifter Peter, who drifts into her life, earns her trust, and moves into her dilapidated hotel room. You should get rid of that. How come? They're dangerous. They have americium-241 in them. After the two have sex for the first time, Peter perhaps unwittingly exposes Agnes to his terrifying certainty that bugs live in his bloodstream. He forces Agnes out of bed to inspect it for a bug that he claims bit him. While played as a tender bonding experience, the incident infects Agnes with this fear of insects and causes her to see conspiracies at play in her own life. We can find the egg, egg sacs now and cut, cut them out of his body. You keep up that cutting, there might not be much left of Peter. In a lovely bit of ambiguity, the audience is never quite certain how much encouragement Agnes needed to go insane. The juice, the bug, the mother, the bug, the super mother bug. Each film employs a documentary style in telling the story of love gone wrong. Schatzberg favors aerial shots from atop or inside of apartment buildings, capturing his characters roaming unpredictable city streets. These scenes are often dialogue free and soundtracked with traffic, the incomprehensible chatter of pedestrian conversation, and the occasional rumbling subway car, reinforcing the impression that we are spying on real people and not trained actors. Bobby and Helen's budding love is affixed with an authenticity that makes it resonate with viewers' personal experience, whether or not they know the world of NYC drug addicts. Friedkin's first work was in the realm of documentaries, and techniques from that world often surface in his films. Early in Bug, we see Agnes putting away her tips after a shift. Friedkin lenses the act like the camera is observing a ritual. While Judd moves with the unconscious ease that comes with repetition, the camera darts left to right and zooms in and out as if recording unstaged movements. As she dumps crumpled ones onto her bed, the camera chases the action of the falling dollar bills. These touches maintain the objectivity necessary to appropriately track the lover's departure from the real world. Schatzberg and Friedkin also expound on the causticity of codependence in the way they frame the human body. Schatzberg frequently uses a triangular composition to provide insight into the bonds that unite Bobby and Helen. The first time Bobby shoots heroin in front of his new lover, he is situated to the right of the frame, while Helen lays in bed on the left. The needle lies between them. As he flexes his hand to prepare his veins for injection, his arm extends toward Helen, visually linking the two of them. We cut away before Bobby shoots up, indicating what is to come. It might not be a problem at the time, but heroin will alternately bring them together and drive them apart. Since the majority of Bug's stage version is set in a cramped motel room, the screen adaptation likewise takes place in a single location with few exceptions. 
Set against barren desert landscape and Agnes's decrepit dwelling, the actor's bodies are the most varied, nuanced, and engaging components of Friedkin's images. The focus on bodies reaches its apex in the sole sex scene between the protagonists. Every body part, isolated in shots that break the corpus into its components, is beaded with sweat, and mouths are simply vehicles for spreading saliva. Grotesquerie receives close attention here, predicting the visceral body horror to come. Each couple ends their respective films in disparate places in terms of relationship status as well as well-being. Despite this divergence, the two movies function as case studies allowing viewers to track the progressive destruction of characters' lives. The shared visual underpinning in these tales, particularly the documentary techniques and the focus on the body, grounds the portrayal in a way that gives the viewer a concrete cautionary example of the destruction that codependency yields regardless of circumstance. Panic and Bug's similar storytelling conveys similar worldviews, bridging a gap of 35 years and 1,500 miles.